Hi, my name is Vlad with Glow Marble, and I just took apart some of my old busted up IKEA tables. I'm gonna refurbish them with epoxy, and let's get right into it. Since these are old, used up, beat up tables, I'm gonna show you the problems that we're having, and the two biggest ones is that I have some holes inside of the tables, and also they have a lot of water damage on them. Where they got dinged up, it's cheap wood, so water got onto it and then it kind of expanded it and made a bubble above that. For the holes, I'm just gonna patch them up with some Bondo, but before I do that, I'm gonna cut open the hole because there's a lot of water damage all around this thing. I'm gonna cut it open and I think that this thing is gonna be hollow on the inside. So that's gonna give us another problem that we're gonna have to talk about later. Yep, so just as I predicted, this table is hollow. It's about yay thick. Um, that's gonna give us a problem because usually when you do a table uh, with epoxy, you want to have rounded edges so that the epoxy can flow over the side and basically cover the entire table. We can't round these edges too much, otherwise that's gonna cause problems for us. The whole top is probably gonna uh, fall off. So instead, what I'm gonna do is try out a new technique where I use the surface tension of the square um, edges to kind of only have the epoxy on top and leave the sides completely black. Um, I'm pretty sure it's gonna look good and it's still gonna be a little bit round because same thing like putting water droplets onto a coin you see that it doesn't really flow over the edge because of the sharp edges, but it does have a nice little rounded um, type of profile. I'm just gonna have to be really careful not to get any over the edge because as soon as you do, it spills over and the whole thing is ruined. Now the next step is obviously to use our Bondo. The Bondo is a pretty easy thing to work with if you understand that you have a limited amount of time to work with it because it sets up pretty quick. You don't wanna mix up too much, just enough that you know you could work with that and then you're not gonna be wasting too much of it. Take a dollop of it, comes in a part A, part B, about this much. Take the part B, which is kind of like a tube, and then you squeeze out this white stuff the more you add, the quicker it's gonna um, set up. So just mix it in until you see no more white streaks inside of it. And uh, one more thing about this stuff, it is kind of stinky, so if you would like to, you should probably do this in a well-ventilated area. It does not smell good at all. Take that, and then just fill up our holes. I might need a little bit more than I mixed up. That's okay. I'm gonna go grab a new stick. You don't wanna use the stick that you mixed up, put it back in there, cause it's kinda hard in the inside of your container. Thanks. About this much. And it doesn't have to be completely flush with this thing because the next step is we're gonna be sanding this. Uh, we're gonna be sanding down those uh, water damage uh, bubbles. So it's better to have it a little bit taller than the rest of it so that the sander can make everything flush and you don't have any pits inside of it um, by accident. So this stuff is sandable after about 15 minutes. So we're gonna start sanding the legs while we wait for this to fully cure. We're not only sanding to get rid of all those uh, water damage marks, but also so that the epoxy has a good 
um, way to bond onto the surface of that. If you just leave it like this, it's gonna flake and chip off. You always have to sand before laying down either your primer or your, um, your regular epoxy. Now, even though I'm not gonna be putting on any metallic epoxy onto the legs, I'm still gonna um, cover them with the primer because I don't know if you can tell on camera, but this isn't exactly black. It's almost like a very dark brown. So I'm gonna go ahead and sand these legs down so that we can put the primer on so it matches the uh, tabletop itself. I'm using 220 grit sanding paper on an orbital sander. You could do it by hand, but it's gonna be a lot longer. And we also got a little bit of delamination going on right here, but that's nothing a little bit of super glue can't fix. So we're gonna put that super glue in there. Once everything is sanded, now it's time for our primer. There's two main reasons why you need a pigmented primer. The first one being that these light spots are definitely gonna show through on the metallic pigments, so you need to clear, uh, clear everything up and make it all one complete color. The second problem is, again, with these light parts, that's basically exposed um, MDF, and it's going to soak in your metallic pigment, uh, your metallic pigment layer and it's not gonna be a good look. This is gonna be covered, and then this, there's gonna be almost like a dry spot in here because it got soaked in, into the wood. Before we can lay on our primer, we have to get rid of all this dust that we created. So the easiest way is some isopropyl or some denatured alcohol, spray it on there, and then wipe it off. You wanna do it with alcohol so that um, it evaporates way quicker than water, and these points that you sanded down don't go rising back up again. They'll just evaporate as soon as, almost as soon as you touch it, and it takes off a decent amount of that um, dust. The next step in prepping for our primer coat is we have to elevate those tabletops, and the easiest way is with these little cone-shaped things. I'm just gonna lay them out, tip up, and place our tabletops on top. Now, let's mix up our primer. Um, I'm gonna show you how to do that right now. So our primer is GEC10W. It's a water-based epoxy, and we are using the color black right now. It's important to choose which color you wanna use because um, that's definitely gonna affect the way that your final product looks. Like I said, the metallic epoxy, um, if you don't use the primer, the light spots are gonna bleed through. Same thing with the color of the primer. I'm doing a dark colors with the metallic, so I'm using the black. If I was, let's say, for the sake of argument, I was making a white and a pink table, I'd probably use a white primer instead of a black one because that would turn the pink into red and the white into gray. As you see, it's a four to one ratio of part A to B. So first thing we gotta do is we have to pre-mix it at the top. This doesn't look like it's completely black, but at the bottom, we have a lot of that pigment kind of sitting there. So pre-mix that, make sure all the pigment at the bottom gets raised to the top, everything is completely mixed, and then we can add four parts B, I, I mean uh, four parts A to one part B. 
all the things that I'm using, all the products that I'm using are in the description below. We sell all of them on the website. And also, um, the coverage for this material is gonna be on the bottom of your screen right now. One part B and four parts A. And we go ahead and mix it pretty thoroughly. All right, so now I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna cover the entire surface and the sides with the primer. I'm using a six inch foam roller. And what sucks is that obviously I can't really <clears throat> have this painted on all four sides. I'm gonna have to have one of them not painted and I'm just gonna paint that once this is tack free enough to be able to flip over and go over again. Never mind, I changed my mind. I'm just gonna have them painted like this and then sat upright, that's the way they're gonna cure. And now, since we don't wanna throw out a perfectly good measuring container, the easiest way to wash it, again, is with denatured alcohol. First thing I'm gonna do is, I'm just gonna wipe down most of it and get most of that material out with a dry cloth, and then I'm gonna go ahead and wash it with that denatured alcohol. One thing you should know about epoxy is the various cure times it can have depending on the temperature it is outside or in your place of work. The hotter it is, the quicker your epoxy is gonna set up, and the colder it is, the slower it's gonna set up also. Um, I don't know how long mine is gonna set up. I do have the heater on, you probably heard it a minute ago, um, but outside it is snowing. So maybe tomorrow it's not gonna be ready to sand yet, We'll check it out tomorrow. So I'm walking out of my warehouse right now. There's our logo. I don't know if you can see, but it is snowing. It's the middle of January right now. Here's the creek that's right by us here in Coney Island. You can see a bunch of shipwrecks. Old wooden ones too. And then down there, that's a yellow submarine like the song. So we're back the next day. Everything's great, it cured. We can start sanding it. Um, there is one slight issue though. Because of the cold, it did take a little bit long to cure. So, so those sanded points, those exposed points, did rise a tiny bit in certain places. It's so minimal that when I put on the metallic coat, it's not gonna matter at all because it's gonna self-level over that. No problem. The only problem is I don't want to sand it too much to expose those points again. The only reason why we're sanding it is so that the metallic coat has a very nice bond onto this coating. It's not going to fall off. Um, so lightly sand it with 220 grit sandpaper and that's going to be perfect amount. <laughs> Now 
Next step again is obviously to get rid of that dust that we just made. Isopropyl denatured alcohol. And then we can get onto the metallic coat. Now that this is all completely sanded, it's time for our metallic coat. And it's very important to make sure that your table is level, especially for what we're doing here. Tables like this, all the epoxy is gonna flow down here over time, and um, it's not gonna be an even surface. So I'm not gonna waste any time trying to level out this table that I have right here. I already have one completely level, and so we're gonna move this over to a different room. So now I went ahead, I put down some plastic just in case it does leak down. The plastic is going to be way easier to clean up than cleaning the epoxy up off the table. I'm going to put down some of those um, elevated little spike things and put my tables on top of them again. So the type of epoxy that you use is actually pretty important because sometimes you think, oh I found this epoxy, it's way cheaper than this one, I'll use that. Um, that's not always the case. Right, we're using Tarbender, which is our um, countertop and tabletop epoxy, which is food safe. That's why we're using it on these countertops. If I were to use something like our GE100 floor epoxy, that isn't food safe. I'm not comfortable putting this on the tables that I'm gonna be eating from. This is a two part A to one part B ratio. So here's the measuring container I'm gonna be measuring with. I'm gonna pour it into a bigger container so that I can mix it easier. Um, for the black, which is our onyx, I'm going to mix up 900 milliliters of um, epoxy. And then for the gunmetal, I want half of that, so I'm going to mix up 450 total. Um, I'll tell you how much of part A and part B I'm using. For the 900 millimeters divided by 3, 300 millimeters of part B times 2, 600 millimeters of part A. For the 450 divided by three, 150 of part B times two, and 300 milliliters of part A. First thing I wanna do is measure out my part A, so 600 milliliters for the black. And you gotta work a little bit slower with the part A because it's not nearly as liquid or as viscous as the part B is. Then I'm just going to go ahead and dump this all out into a larger container. Let that sit there for a little bit and completely fall out. And now let's do 300 milliliters of part A for our gunmetal gray. Now we're gonna go ahead and measure out our part B. So that's 300 milliliters for the black. And 150 mil for the gray. A lot of people like to add their pigments into the part A first, but I like to do the opposite. I like to add the pigments into the part B because the part B is way more viscous. It's almost like water. And so the metallic pigments get to saturate inside of there much better and it helps reduce the amount of um, comets that you get inside of your work. Take a generous dollop of our onyx, throw it in there, maybe a little bit more. and then half as much of that with our gunmetal. Now let's go ahead and get the rest of that out of there. Now we're gonna go ahead and add that part B into our part A.
One last check just to make sure that there's no um, dust or debris that can create comets for us on our tabletop and we're going to start pouring because you don't want that epoxy to be sitting inside of the bucket for too long. That's how you get it to heat up way too quick and it might cause problems for you. I'll start off with the black just making polka dots here and there trying to stay away from the edge as much as possible. And we're going to have to work very delicately next to the edge so I don't want this stuff overflowing where I can't control it before I can even start texturing this and moving the epoxy around. Don't even think about where you're putting these dots. Try to make it as random as possible. That way it's going to look much nicer. Now we're going to go grab that gunmetal and hit it in between every single spot that we got right there. Again, we're not even thinking about the pattern that we're making. We're just doing this as random as possible. Now here's the part where we start texturing and it's very simple, very easy to do. And the secret ingredient is just a plastic reusable spoon. We're gonna take this and start moving it around randomly. Again, we're trying to do this as random as possible. You start making any type of patterns in your um, maneuvering of this epoxy and it's gonna be noticeable um, because it's not spreading like how a normal epoxy usually does being very careful around those edges. Those edges are gonna to be touched up by my finger later so that I know for a fact I've got the best possible chance of this not going uh, over the edge. And you don't wanna mix it up too much in one spot either because then it's gonna become some type of jumble of nasty looking colors where you can't even tell what's black, what's gray. Less is more when you're texturing. Just make sure that like one spot right here, there's too much gray. I don't like that. That's where I'll move it around. I'll leave it alone. Moving on to the next table. Now we're going to have to go and smooth it basically towards the edge, but not over. That's the most important thing. Let the epoxy self-leveling properties do the rest of the work. If you do get a little bit of spillage, wipe that off with your finger. And you see how over here in this corner, it's way thinner than it is over here. And that's completely fine because the epoxy is gonna take its time to start spreading out and self-level on its own. It's not gonna stay that thin on that part. You finally got all that done. That took way longer than any other epoxy table I usually do, but it is what it is. That's how we're supposed to do this table. Now the next thing is we have to address the bubbles. Some people like using isopropyl alcohol to spray it. 
Um, I don't like doing that because that disturbs the texture. I want to keep this texture um, basically around the way that it is, so instead I'm going to be using a torch. These torches are great for doing this, but you have to make sure not to leave it on your epoxy for too long or else you're going to notice that it started to yellow or in dark colors it starts to look brown. You basically just burnt your epoxy. That's never a good thing. Look at the amount of bubbles that just took care of. Then once you torched it, you wanna wait for another five, 10 minutes and then go ahead and torch that again, just to make sure you get every single bubble that's still somewhat down in there and can resurface later. At times after torching, you could get some bug holes, so you could literally just fix them with your finger and they're gonna close right back up on themselves. So I know for a fact that this epoxy is not gonna look like this when it fully cures up. It's gonna start moving around like all epoxy does, so I'm gonna leave the camera on. Let's see if we can do a time lapse for you. Now we're done for the day. All we gotta do is wait until tomorrow to sand and put our sealer on. So here we are the next day. It fully cured. This is what it looks like, I really like it. I'm going to show you the other table and then I'm going to show you the edges, a little close up of it. So I'm going to show you guys why we need a sealer. This is a sample board I made on the back of a hardy backer board, um, lightweight stuff. I always suggest you guys make a sample board just to see how that epoxy is going to start moving around as you saw. It does move around on its own and it's not going to look the same way uh, as it did when you started texturing it. So see how the colors play and also to practice the technique that you're going to be using to texture that epoxy. So let's pretend this is a cup, it's not even glass, it's plastic. I move it around and there are scratches that are permanent. That was just with plastic, but it would be even worse with a fork or anything like that. So you definitely want to make sure that your countertops are scratch resistant and they have a good finish also. And now again, the next step is to sand the surface so that the sealer and the epoxy have a good mechanical bond onto each other. I'm using 220 grit. Then one more time, we wash that off with some denatured alcohol. So now it's time to apply our sealer. I'm gonna be using XS PC12, which is a solvent-based um, polyurethane countertop sealer, but there is a water-based option called XS327. I'm gonna be using the solvent-based because they tend to be a little bit more durable um, the downside is they're way more stinky when you're applying them. I don't care because I'm in the warehouse right now. I'm not doing this at home. So I'm opting for the solvent based. So it's a one part B to three parts A. I'm going to do 50 mil of part B and then 150 of part A. Mix the whole thing up together. And I'm gonna start off with the legs this time. I already sanded them and everything. Again, using that six inch foam roller.
And now let's go ahead and start on our countertops. This isn't going to be as easy as the legs because the countertop is much larger, so we might get roller marks. I'll show you how to make sure we don't though. The technique for making sure you don't get any roller marks is called back rolling, which means that you don't just roll in the same direction and then you're done. You have to keep going this way, then this way, then this way, a few times just to make sure that everything is blended completely smoothly. Now we're basically done. I just have to wait for this to cure and come back tomorrow. Here's the reason why you gotta sand in between coats. This is just on a glossy surface on a trash bag. It comes right off. This won't happen when you have the surface sanded. So you have a good bond to it. So here's what ended up happening because this warehouse is so dusty. Thankfully, the manufacturer does recommend two coatings. So I'm gonna sand this and take this home where it's way less dusty and do the second coat there. <clears throat> if it really is not an option to work in a completely dust-free environment, um, here's something that could help you. Make sure that you minimize the amount of dust that you're gonna be kicking up. Um, obviously, apart from mopping, uh, sweeping everything, and making sure you're in a different room, the most dust-free room, Something you can do is spray regular water on all of your walls, the ceiling, and the floor. And what this does is it traps the dust that's stuck onto the floor. And when you're moving past it, brushing past a wall, your feet won't be kicking up as much dust as they usually do. So that's gonna minimize the amount of dust that you actually pick up and put onto your uh, surface a lot. Hi guys, it's lovely Lorenza here. Hi. You saw her in the other video where we did this wall art. You can check that out after this video though. Don't skip ahead. There's Lisa. Hey, sweetie. Hey, pumpkin. She got a little bit fat. <laughs> she got a little fat. This is real bootleg. As you can tell, we have no tables. We haven't had tables for a little bit, so we're gonna have to be doing this on the floor. So, to make the sealer, we need to use one part B and then three parts A. God damn it, this smells intense. That's what I was saying. I didn't think I was gonna have to do this at home. So if I knew I was gonna be doing it at home, I would have bought the water base, the XS327. I'm already using the PC-12, so that's what we're stuck with. We're gonna be sleeping in the middle of January, mind you, with the windows open in the living room and the cat sleeping with us in the bedroom. All right, that's enough mixing. And so again, we got that six inch foam roller. I can't stand by this more than I already do. I really like this thing. Um, we don't really need it for this type of project, but it's great for projects where there's a lot of depth. If we're doing something like stamped concrete, foam rollers are really great because they mold and move into the shapes that they should be going into. So, baby, we're gonna do something called back rolling, which means first we're gonna roll this way, and then roll that way, and then roll this way, and that's gonna remove any roller marks, any line between where the roller was. We don't need a lot. That was a lot, though. Okay, just start rolling. What? No, you do this, you do this first. All right. Uh... To be honest, I think that we're gonna have enough for both those tables. And then you just go back and forth and we're gonna keep switching directions to make sure there's no roller marks. If you notice, by the way, the sides are covered with um, blue tape, blue painter's tape, because the sides, they didn't get hit by the dust as hard. They're perfectly fine and I don't wanna sit here and start um, putting the sealer on the sides also, just in case we do 
mess it up with the boxes we're going to put on it later. Do I press hard? No. Let the roller do the work, by the way. You never want to press hard. The roller is saturated. It's moving all by its own. The only time you want to press hard is if you think you don't have enough material and you're just at the end of finishing it. Press your roller to squeeze some of that material out and you'll be fine. Otherwise, just let the roller do all the work for you. Squeezing too hard, by the way, is one of the causes of roller marks. So when you're back rolling, again, phrase I said like 200 times already, let the roller do all the work. And we're good just to make sure that there's not gonna be any more um, dust settling onto our tables, we are gonna put some cardboard boxes on it and leave it like that overnight. And now we're gonna wait until tomorrow. We're gonna see what that finished product looks like and show it to you guys. Yep. So it's the next day, they're dry to the touch, way better than they were when I did them in the warehouse. Let's take off that blue tape. Now let's go ahead and assemble those legs. So you've made it to the end of my video, but now I want to ask you for a quick favor. See the YouTube algorithm gets tricked into showing my video to a lot more people if a lot of people comment on it. So criticize me, praise me, or just ask a question. As long as you leave a comment, I'm going to appreciate it a lot. Thanks for watching and uh, stay tuned for the next video.